1930. Still the third largest producer per capita of coal in the world is West Virginia. But there are only 15,000 coal miners, from 130,000 to 15,000. And you see how that impacted the labor pool. So what ends up happening is then you have this mass exodus from West Virginia. So the exodus from West Virginia began around in the 40s, and it continued. So the, the African-American population in West Virginia went from 130-some thousand blacks in West Virginia to the day there's only 56,000 because people started to leave because of the coal jobs started to dry up, mechanization, uh, technology. There was no place to put this semi-skilled labor, and so the labor then was pulled into the urban centers like Detroit, where there were manufacturing automobiles, Pittsburgh, where steel was king, Washington, D.C., where the federal government was open up to hiring people. So you had a mass exodus. And some of you can remember, by, 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 if you're in my age bracket, normally when you graduated from high school, you were getting up out of here. There was nothing to keep you here. There was no opportunity. So either you went to college or you moved to a city where there would be employment opportunities. So now you've got more people leaving the state. In particular, you've got more men leaving the state between the draft Uncle Sam's draft, drafting men into the military, some of which never came back, and men leaving the state because of employment opportunities in other places, then what you end up happening is now you've got more women than there are men. And so now you have fewer families being created. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is that when the economy changes, it has an impact on the family. So in a rural economy, in an economy that is still rural in nature, the family is going to be stronger, it's going to be tighter knit. But as industrialization and urbanization takes place, and as people become more mobile, you find the family becoming less and less stable in neighborhoods and in institutions. And that's where we are now. So now in this, in this high tech economy, people are moving all over the place all the time. And people are postponing getting married. And so there's almost a movement afloat. Go to college, go to graduate school, get all your education out the way, get a good job, settle somewhere, and wait till you get married. You may be 28, 29, 30 years old. Which again, that's, this is a, 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 that's a new phenomenon. In a rural time, people get married 16, 17, 18. That was not uncommon. I mean, that's what you did. You graduated from high school, you didn't graduate from high school, you dropped out of high school, you went to the military, or you went to the coal mines, or you found a job, and you established a family. So what I'm just trying to get you to understand is that historically, there was a commitment to establishing family. And people understood the value of establishing a family. And, and, and its value to the, the neighborhood, to the church, and to the life of the entire society, and that's no longer the case. So now what we have is that Establishing families is something that's up for discussion, it's up for debate. I mean, the whole institution of marriage now has been debated as to whether or not it's outlived its usefulness. Does it still, is it still essential to the main maintenance and stabilization of our society? And I will suggest that it is. One of the things that makes the church so important, one of the reasons we need the church, is because the church reminds us it reminds us that we are a part of a family. It reminds us that we're not here by ourselves, that we're not living a life as a lone ranger or as a spiritual free agent, but we are connected to other people who value us. We're connected to an institution that has value to the society, that has value to the community and to the neighborhood, and that we are an integral part of this institution, the church, the people of God, the family of God. And so for many of us, we were in a less than a desirable family situation, and some of us were in a most desirable family situation. And so whether we were in a most desirable or a less desirable family situation, the church provides with us an opportunity to continue to be a part of a family. So if it was bad in the past, we get a chance to be a part of a family that can be better. If it was good in the past, we get an opportunity to be a part of creating a church environment, an atmosphere that's like a family that we can be a part of enhancing and maintaining that type of a family environment. Are you following me? 
So very early in the life of the church, Acts chapter 2 is the genesis. It's the birth of the church. So the church did not exist prior to Acts chapter 2. So after the Lord Jesus Christ, life, his ministry, his betrayal, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection, he told the disciples to go back to Jerusalem, and there they would wait, and he would send them the gift of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural enabler, the comforter, the one that would be just like him, who would then come, live inside of his people, be in the midst of his people, and bind and knit his people together as a family, as the church, as the people of God. So as we saw in last week, we were looking at why do we need the church to be reminded that we have power. P Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost before several hundred thousand people who had gathered in Jerusalem for the Pentecostal fee. And Peter declares that this miraculous phenomenon that you are witnessing, hearing people speak in languages of other countries, hearing about the wonderful works of God, this miraculous Pentecostal ph phenomenon is God fulfilling his promise to send the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit served two purposes. One, the first and the most important one, is that the Holy Spirit, he baptized the believers into the body of Christ. They were then baptized, they were then immersed, they were then identified, and they were connected together in a mysterious way that they had not been connected together before. Because now as the Spirit came to fill, to live inside each of the believers, he also served a purpose of knitting them together, of baptizing them together. And the word baptism simply means to be identified with, to be immersed in. For example, uh, during this quick time, if a lady was going to dye a garment, she had a white garment and she wanted to make it red, she would have some red dye that she would concoct up from different plants and so forth to create the dye. She would add water to it and she would say, I'm going to baptize this garment. She wouldn't say, I'm going to dye it. They didn't have that word. She said, I'm going to baptize it. And so what did she do? She took the white garment and she immersed it into the red dye water. She baptized it. She identified the white garment with the red dye. And after identifying the white garment with the red dye, what color did the garment become? It became red because it was immersed in, it was baptized into the red dye. In the church, in a couple of weeks, we will have a baptismal service. And so the baptismal service is the ritual of the church where we take people who put their faith in Christ, they receive Christ their personal Savior, and then we baptize them in the water. We immerse them into the water. Now, we don't put dye in the water so the people come up red and green and blue and purple. No, the water is clear and it's clean. But we are baptizing them. We are identifying them with the water. But it's more than identifying them with the water. What it actually does, it is identifying them with Christ and with the church, the people of God. So when people are baptized, what they're saying is, I've already trusted Christ as my personal Savior. And when I received Christ as my personal Savior, the Holy Spirit, he identified me with Christ. And he identified me with the church. And now I'm doing this publicly to let you know that I've already been identified with Christ. So water baptism, it is the writ of the church whereby a person is publicly saying, I have been Identify with Christ. I've been baptized into Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. And so when we put people into the water, it symbolizes them dying with Christ. And when people come up out of the water, it symbolizes them being raised with Christ so they now can walk in a newness of life. And baptism is important because baptism allows you to say something publicly that you've already done privately. It is a public expression of an inward commitment. And so on the day of Pentecost, the Lord identified all of those who were there with him in his death, burial, and his, in his resurrection. And they became the church, the body of Christ. And they would be this continuation of the life of Christ. Are you following? So listen to what the writer of the book of Acts says. Verse 14, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word,